Dare to Dream. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger and welcome to Dare to Dream. Today's show features Krista Marie Miller here to talk about the power of divine sexuality. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do amazing energy work out into the world. And if you would like to become a facilitator or take a class anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com, as well as Access Consciousness. Dot com. And I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I help owners and coaches and speakers and healers become highly visible out in the world. I coach you on how to write a highly engaging book, both through private sessions and through group sessions. I also take authors' books to a guaranteed international bestseller. And finally, I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you would like to learn more about how to do this and start doing it right away, I've got a free gift for you so you can start. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. I am right now nominated for a COVR, which is a visionary Coalition of Visionary Resources Award. So there is voting going on right now. And this show has been featured in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. So thanks for being a part of that. I'm always grateful to my listeners and subscribers. Do subscribe now if you don't already. This episode today features a conversation on the secrets of Isis and Mary Magdalene. My guest is Krista Marie Miller, who is a master hypnotist, intuitive medium, voice channeler, certified aura color coach, and Reiki master. Krista began channeling spirit at the age of seven when she was visited by special friends that only she could see, bringing beautiful messages of love and fascinating stories of life from thousands of years in the past. Central among those friends were Mary Magdalene and Yeshua, who we know today as Jesus. They told Krista Marie the true stories of their lives, shared their deep wisdom teachings, and continued with transformational guidance for all of humanity. Today, Krista Marie channels Mary Magdalene, a generally misunderstood real life historical figure and brings her teachings to the modern world during this time of rapid evolution. And to learn more about her, go to her website, which is KristaMarieMiller.com. And with that, I welcome Krista Marie to the Dare to Dream show. So good to have you. So wonderful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. And I found Krista Marie after I read a book about Mary Magdalene's wisdom and divine sexuality being channeled. And then ta-da, Krista Marie was speaking at the Conscious Life Expo recently. And of course I went to her workshop and I was like, okay, I need to know this woman and here we are. So I wanted to share her with you. So before we get started, Krista Marie, just tell people about the work you do so they're clear and the people, let's call it who you serve. Beautiful. Well, uh, my main focus is on serving those individuals who are, they feel blocked or trapped in their sexuality, sensuality, or even finding passion or soul purpose in their life. So many of us out there right now are, you know, searching for that bigger picture, searching for something that really lights them up. And uh, Magdalene has taught me since an early age uh, how to achieve that through multiple ways, but mainly through uh, orgasm sexual orgasm and getting into bliss body and flow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Among my other passions, I love anything spiritual. The more woo, the better. (laughs) I I communicate with star beings, light beings. This is all going down from the lineage of uh, Hathor and Isis. Uh, So there's nothing off topic when you get book a session with me or a one-on-one session with me. Um, I just really love to dive deep. I'm a huge advocate and researcher in quantum physics and how it interplays into all of this 
and also I'm very well rounded in the Hindu religion. Uh, and for because Krishna and Lord Shiva also came to me at the same time, Magdalene and uh, Yeshua came to me. So it, it all interplays beautifully. Um, and it's all about sacred femininity and finding that and rising that within us. And we are all doing a beautiful job right now. Everybody's like the rise of the femininity is here and it's happening and I'm witnessing it and I'm witnessing all of you go through your transformation. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful journey we are all on. Talk about that a little more, the sacred femininity. So we've all heard, you know, we'll actually have peace when women get back into leadership. And we've all been watching this very interesting inequality and abuse be brought to the light. Uh, what else do you see that's happening around that and how people are responding and stepping up? Well, it actually all started with Yeshua. There is an actual scripture called the Book of Love that Yeshua wrote in his own hand, giving so much love and gratitude to the women in his life. Mm. So his actual scripture talks about the women in his life and how they shaped and molded him and how we need to rise, raise the femininity into ourselves. And so that was one of his main teachings. Of course, it got squashed by the modern church because they wanted the masculine to rule. Um, and but so this book of love scripture is actually hidden, very well hidden right now. Um, the Catholic Church does have versions of it, uh, but the full scripture is uh, kept within uh, sacred families. Um, and what he talked about, and then what Magdalene also brought to the table is yes, the rise of sacred femininity is important, but it's not to be squandered or shadowed by the divine masculine. And we need to learn more better what the divine masculine is, how it serves us and uplifts us and how Magdalene and Yeshua so many photos of her, or I should say paintings of her, are like her at the feet of Yeshua, when in reality, they stood side by side teaching together in honor mm -hmm. and honoring each other. So uh, there is uh, many sacred rituals about balancing the divine feminine, divine masculine. And so, yes, the rise of femininity is happening, but it needs to rise to the level of a divine masculine as well. So I'm a few, huge believer in both need to be present within us and with our relationships with other people. I'm so glad you brought that up. I had a conversation with somebody knowing that I was preparing for you and for this, and I brought up Mary Magdalene, and this is a seeker. And so, you know, when he mentioned, uh, oh yeah, I didn't realize that about her and the sexual magic and the temple of Isis and so forth. And he said, oh, she was a prostitute, right? And I said, ah, that was a myth. In fact, perpetuated by religion, literally as abuse to hold her and other women down. And they categorized her so, so horrible um, for somebody who came here to be a leader in a light. But will you address that a little bit so people know from the get-go what we're really talking about? Yeah. So I remember uh, at a young age, one of the first times I went to church and I heard that I went into a complete fit because once they described what a prostitute was, I was like, what? Like they literally, my mom had to kind of take me out of Sunday school because I was huge fit. Like I, and, and didn't go to church much after that, to be honest. <laughs> um, so, and I've really sat with that and I've talked with Magdalene a lot about it. And the way she describes it is, uh, well, obviously they put that label on her and they actually did that, I wanna say around 700 AD, um, Pope Gregory VII was the one who coined her as that. Uh, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty accurate, but it's because they wanted to put her in a lesser light. There were so many, especially the Cathars were, uh, who were in the south of France, were preaching her lessons and teaching and a whole crusade was against them to wipe them completely out. Um, everything was just made to wipe out. So she was, she was not a prostitute. Uh, she was actually came from a high ranking family um, and actually funded Yeshua's, uh, you know, teaching you know, his pilgrimages. She was one of his main funders. So she had a lot of money uh, from her family, from her father, and uh, was wealthy enough to go and travel with him and not be at home taking care of a home. So she was very independent woman. And she was initiate of the Temple of Isis. Now, a par partial of that is the sacred sexuality.
spirituality, but it really has to do with the hieroscamos, the sacred partnership, the spiritual partnership with your partner. And uh, so she wore heavy, and she was also a nitrous. Every, every time you see her, she always has an alabaster jar. So she was um, she was very much into anointing. So heavy, heavy scented oils. Mm -hmm. So she walked around heavily scented in oils, very nicely dressed. And so think about it. This was during uh, Jewish and Roman times. If you're not of the culture and not of the religion, even in, in that time, you're going to be labeled. You're going to be, you know, considered a sinner, considered these demons inside of you because you have different views in them. And we can see it repeating again today, you know, in even with the Me Too movement, it's just like, oh, well, you deserved that or you put that upon yourself. And it's like, no, this is what culture is labeling us with. Same thing happened to her. They labeled her because, you know, she she you, and the prostitutes would be heavily oiled. They would be heavily scented. But she was of completely different class and did it for spiritual reasons. And part of my teachings also is how to properly anoint yourself with Egyptian oils um, and the whole process of uh, honoring yourself. Uh, so Egyptian oils, they're anointing oils. They're not essential oils, though I love all the essential oils out there. Um, my Egyptian oils are a little bit different. They're anointing and they're a little bit thicker, a little bit richer, um, and they're beautiful and wonderful. And yeah, so that's why she got labeled. <laughs> and explain what the temple of Isis was for these priestesses and initiates. Wonderful. So uh, the temple of Isis, um, now this is my understanding and I'm a huge believer in take what you want and leave the rest. It's my understanding. So Hathor was our mother. Hathor came down from the stars, um, a light being. I don't like the term alien. Alien is a derogatory term <laughs> for everybody out there. Um, I like the term light being. So Hathor was a light being and the Hathors was a culture race that came down in order to manipulate our DNA. They saw us as a human race. We weren't evolving in a proper, in a proper they wanted it to speed it up a little bit. Um, so the missing link that everybody talks about from Cro-Magnum to Homo sapien actually happened because Hathor and five other star families um, from different areas around the galaxies um, came in and manipulated the human DNA. What Hathor did was she created the female clitoris and the male penis head in order for us to have orgasms. Uh, she also did, uh, she also uh, put the pineal gland in a different spot in the brain. I won't get too technical in that, but it was moved and you can actually see that through uh, the evolution of human um, because this is what's gonna help us properly manifest help us properly ignite our light body. And uh, that is what, so Hathor taught this to all the region, and then Isis created a temple around Hathor's teachings. Now, fun fact, Hathor did not come into a human body until later in life as Isis's um, daughter-in-law. Uh, so that was the only time Hathor ever came down into a human body. But she, Hathor was already a creator god when she was uh, became human because she wanted to experience what human life was like. Isis became a creator god through the way we are currently doing it, through evolution, through life after life after life after life, perfecting her skills. And this is what's taught in the temple of Isis is how to perfect those skills in order to become a creator God. We all know we have that spark of God and within us, we are already a God. Our next evolution is how to become a creator God with the use of manifestation and uh, sacred rituals and practices that she taught and created a whole temple and culture around these teachings of Hathor. So that's my understanding. Um, Mother Mary was actually an initiate of Isis as well. My understanding was she was actually Isis reincarnated and she kind of played matchmaker to Mary Magdalene. She saw Magdalene at a well. She had a golden uh, snake band on her upper arm, knowing and showing that, yes, I'm a proud priestess of the temple of Isis. And uh, Mother Mary said, that's the one for my son. That's her. And they had a discussion and later Yeshua and Magdalene met and it was Love at first sight. <laughs> it was on from there. <laughs> it was on. <laughs> love story. Yeah, so beautiful. I also understand that Mary and Yeshua spoke Aramaic, which is a Semitic language, a Syrian dialect um, from the Near East from about uh, 6th century BC. 
and that her name then um, either, anyway, as we, in Aramaic, but as we translated in English, spelling in English, is Mariam, like M-A-R-Y-A-M, or Mary, right. which, and I want to check in with you on this, which means the one who shines God's light. Yes. Has she ever verified this with you? Yeah, so Mariam was actually her real name. We've just kind of English or modernized it to Mary. And Magdalene actually translates to Magdala, which means tower. So in essence, she was a lighthouse. She was a light tower. That's uh, also why Yeshua put her up on this. And when I say she, he put her up on a pedestal, this is not in a worship type sense. It's just an, I honor you and I see you who for you are because she shone, she shined so brightly. She um, was also trained um, in the temple of Isis. She actually got trained as a death doula as well. Um, and this uh, has to also to do heavily with the incense and herbs and anointing. Um, and so as a death doula, she was able to overcome the crucifixion. She was able to hold her power and wits together. Imagine seeing your love being up there, being crucified. And of course she, she was torn apart, but she was really the lighthouse in the tower. Where were the other male disciples of the crucifixion? No, they ran and hid. <laughs> uh, she was the strong one. So that's why she was, she's always kind of, um, I always kind of see her as the lighthouse tower. And that's what Miriam of Magdalene means. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Powerful woman. So let's dive a little bit into the sexuality part, the yummy right. part. <laughs> Is sacred sexuality essential? because it is our life force, what's the reasoning? Okay, um, so sacred sexuality, um, you do, um, it is more intricate, I'll use that word, it's more intricate with a partner, but you can have sacred sexuality with yourself through the act of masturbation. And that's a term that we really need to get over and we need, really need to start shaming because we need self-love. Masturbation is self-love and there's nothing to be guilty or shamed about it. So what the practice of sacred sexuality is, is in essence to strengthen your light body. This is what Yeshua and Magdalene did. They were, uh, Yeshua knew he was very prophetic and Magdalene was prophecy. She saw prophecy, she saw visions. She was the only disciple to see visions. So she, she, along with Yeshua, they both knew what was going to happen to him. In fact, he set it up to be crucified on that exact day, which is uh, 29 degrees of Pisces. That was the actual day he got crucified. Zero degrees Aries was the day of mourning. The first degrees of Aries was the resurrection. So we've actually already passed the crucifixion, <laughs> uh, but uh, the Christian Catholic Church, of course, like all religions, they wrapped it around a Druid holiday and Celtic holiday in order to make it more palatable for the people to convert them. Um, that's why we celebrate it. Um, I believe it's at the second full moon of the something like that. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, don't quote me. <laughs> um, but uh, the the act of sacred sexuality. So they knew what was going to happen. Magdalene had these tools in her tool belt and Yeshua was knowing he was the Messiah. And knowing that he was this, he was a great teacher. He didn't want to be worshipped. He didn't want to be idolized, but he wanted to leave something behind. So what they began doing was strengthening his light body. And you do that through sacred sexual acts. The light body, um, so Magdalene coming through me, the teachings that I'm teaching, there's 12 energetic bodies. The light body is on energetic bodies 8 through 12 really start solidifying in number uh, energetic body number nine. Through these energetic bodies in the light body, Magdalene and Yeshua strengthened it so much that when he passed on the cross, on most timelines, he did pass on the cross. There's a few realities where he did not. Um, so if you read that, oh, he survived the crucifixion? Yes, he did on some timelines. Most timelines, he did die on the cross. Um, so on the majority of the timelines where he did die on the cross, what he did, the pur whole purpose of passing on the cross was to create a light path for souls to follow. Before the crucifixion, souls would pass out of the body and wander around in the dark, kind of like you're wandering around trying to find a light source. 
And this is why the death acts and death rites in ancient Egypt were so elaborate because they needed the soul to have safe passage into the light afterlife because there was nothing for them to follow. Yeshua dying, his light body was so strong, so vibrant, so vital that he created a light path for us all souls to follow, not just certain saved people. No, all souls to follow. This is why you hear, oh, I saw light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I walked into, you know, a tunnel of light. Yeshua did that for us. He did not die for our sins. He created a light path for all us to follow. And for me personally, that's so much more powerful than dying for our sins, which he obviously did not do. <laughs> so sacred sexuality strengthens your light body. Your light body is what's taken with you after life. Your light body holds past life information, holds all the information from this. Um, your light body is wrapped around your soul. And that is what's carried with you. So that's why it's so, so important. And you can strengthen your light body through orgasm. Magdalene told me we should have four to five orgasms a day. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> I'm like, how will we ever get out of the bedroom? Uh, and she laughed at me. She's oh, oh so patient with me. I love her dearly. She said, no, my dear, uh, there's different types of orgasms. You can have an emotional orgasm. You can have a spiritual orgasm. You can have a creative orgasm. An orgasm to her is when you get into flow. And flow is where you lose sense of self, <gasps> sense of time. Uh, time can either speed up or slow down. So in the sixth energetic body, the bliss body, this is where we can manipulate time. Mm. And that's how you strengthen your light body. That was a good explanation. And I know that they describe when they talk about flow, I've heard it say, or being in a zone, look at a child. If a child and whatever is in front of them, crayons or something that they're working with, they have no sense of time, no sense of location. It's just exactly whatever's happening in that space, which is a great example to consider. And as adults, to hear what you're describing, these orgasms that can happen in these different places in life, yeah. that sounds very exciting. I know in my music, I'd like to have that more in my singing. I'm getting there. It's happening, but I would like to have that complete abandon and disregard, if you will, for who's there in front of me. It's healing. It's so healing. And if you've ever, um, I'm a mixed media artist. So like when I get into flow and I close my eyes, I literally see flashes of light. Or if you've ever had a very strong orgasm, you've seen flashes of light. This is your light body. This is your physical body seeing your light body. So that's a really good indication that you are in flow. If you're, and it does have to do with the brain firing as well, if you wanna get into the neurotransmitters and the quantum physics of it all. But it's in essence, strengthening your light body. So um, anytime, like, you know, like when you're reading a good book and someone calls your name, don't even hear it. When you're in the car and you are just got full body chills and crying from a song, that's flow. Mm -hmm. So getting into that high passionate, just complete abandonment of time and space and who you are, we should be doing that four to five times a day. Okay. For me, it's research. When I start researching and, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of everything, man, I can do that all day long. Or I can be painting or reading a book or channeling Magdalene, man, I can channel her for hours on end. <laughs> I can so, listen to it for hours on end. <laughs> she is amazing. <laughs> amazing. So between you and Magdalene, I don't know if she's with us right now. Um, are there sex magic secrets from the Temple of Isis that you can share with us? Yes, well, absolutely. There's many. Um, let me ask her, where does she, where, for the best and highest good of the listening that is listening here and in the future, what would you like to talk about? All right, should I just channel her? Yes, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so welcome. we don't remove my filter and just let her come in through purely. Okay. My dearest ones, thank you for arriving and being here today and being present. For that is another key to flow. Another key to sacred sexuality is being present. Not worrying about the past, not worrying about the future, but being the present now. 
as the dear one has already said that, that it is about being so focused on where you are and what your task is at hand that is a key and a very good first step to sacred sexuality now today i want to talk about a little bit of uh the, the shame and the guilt around uh self-love or what you term as masturbation we have always called it in the sacred temple of isis as self-love it has always been self-love not masturbation because the actual the 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 victorian times really i saw this from the other side they really twisted it they twisted sexuality into something oh taboo and not to be talked about and this is not the case now should you be going out in public and displaying your sexuality mm, no not really this is something of a sacred act to be doing within your home within and if you want a partner or partners yes that is even available if you want multiple partners completely up to you does not diminish the sacred sex act but for me personally and for my Yeshua, we wanted a monogamous one-on-one -on -one relationship because the focus of strengthening your light body is so highly important that if you have multiple partners and multiple light bodies coming in, it gets a little diluted. So this is why in my case, and it's not for everybody, and what is right for you, you know. But for us, it was strengthening our light bodies one-on-one. -on -one. And so what I wanted to talk about was uh, the, about the ego and about um, really stepping in to a healthy ego around this and being in the present moment as a, a means to an end. So now let me explain what a means to an end means. It is having an intention of what you want to do when you are doing a sacred act as such in masturbation. There should be an intention of why you're doing it. Now, if you want to focus on the sacred sexuality aspect, this is something you want to manifest. What do you want to manifest and focus on in your sacred act? So this could be more abundance, this could be health, this could be any type of uh, avenue that you want to heighten in your life. So focus on an, one intention. Now, I say per orgasm, you have one intention. Don't have multiple intentions because, again, that can dilute the frequency and the energy. Now, you do not have to think about the intention the whole time you are self-pleasuring. Just think of it at the very beginning of your act and hold sacred space. Light some candles for yourself. Put some incense on. Put anoint yourself with oils. That really sets the tone. But if you don't have the oils or anything right now, you can simply start with a white candle. I very, very highly recommend a white candle. Um, and as long as long as the candle is white, it doesn't matter what type of jar or container it's in, as long as the candle is white. But holding that sacred space for the white candle brings in the Holy Christ consciousness that surrounds you. And then once you have that, you know, set your intention, say that you want a healthy, all your cells to be healthy and alive and alert. Set that, you just ignite it and say it out loud. I like saying it into the candle. It's very fascinating to watch when you speak into a candle. This is part of our teachings in that temple of Isis. When you speak into the candle, the candle will act differently. The candle will respond in saying, yes, this is of your truest light. No, this is of not. So if you try, just, just have fun with it. And you really watch the flame for the flame talks. For the flame, when you light it with intention, with the Holy Christ consciousness, it will respond and communicate with you. So I like to speak it into the flame saying, I want higher, better health, all my cells to be alive and happy. And then you begin the self-pleasuring act. Now at the point of orgasm, is when you want to think about that again. If you're comfortable enough to say it out loud at the point of orgasm, fantastic. But if you're with a partner and they don't really know what you're doing or they're a little uneasy about all this, you can say it internally. Now, after the point of orgasm, it sends it out in intense electromagnetic waves that goes out not only to your light body, but to beyond. I have seen powerful orgasms that have gone all the way up into the cosmos. Your intention of beauty and strength is 
felt, especially when doing through the act of orgasm. Now, if you do not want to have a physical orgasm and you want to have more of a mental orgasm, then before you go, if you know that painting gets you into flow, again, light your white candle and just say, I want abundance in my bank account. I want my bank account to increase, we'll say $10,000, because why not? $10,000. Now, if you are setting an intention with an amount, you definitely want to set a time and day. I have learned this through our dear Krista, that yes, here in spirit, we don't really understand what the time and everything like that, we forget. It's very easy to forget about time. So set a time, say by, you know, April 24th at noon, 2022, don't forget the year. Uh, I want $10,000 to be increased in my bank account and then start painting start getting into flow. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And then you can almost feel it. Your body will start rocking. That is the point of peak orgasm. When you are in flow, your body will usually, I love all of you, but Kundalini is very, very basic, very basic, very beginning, but the movement or the swaying that is the kundalini energy going up the spine and this is when you know it, when you are doing a non-physical flow is that you are in flow my my dear one my dear debbie you know that when you start singing you start swaying yes this, this is true flow. this is exactly what i'm thinking when i listen to you yes that is orgasm that is a physical orgasm and you're strengthening your light body so at that time saying i'm increasing my bank account by ten thousand dollars <laughs> i love it and, and singing so, <laughs> and then you, if you as our dear krista just said if you close your eyes you can actually see the flashes of light and you know that's how it is activated mm -hmm. you know that it is so and it is so and it is so and then you just release it and then you let it go. You don't think about it again. Don't don't worry about it. You know, um, with the the big thing that I teach is about the four pillars. I know we don't have time to go into that today, but you have security in happening. It, you have security knowing that it'll happen. You have trust. You have safety, and you have honor, knowing that it is so. Beautiful. And I am going to because I know our time is limited, so I will leave you with that for now. But hopefully, that gave you a little bit to start on your beautiful new journey into sacred sexuality and so many blessings. I will leave you with that for now. And as Krista comes back, I just want the audience to know as I am purposely speaking very quietly that when she comes back, she often does not know she vacates. So she does not know what has been shared. So she'll often say, how was that? Or, you know, what transpired? So it's clear for people, if you're not watching us on YouTube, and listening instead. So Crystal, welcome back and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to get over that fear because when I first started channeling, um, I'll just be very vulnerable and open. I was a trained actress. I was I wanted to be an actress. And so when I was channeling, I'm like, am I making it up? Is it true? And then um, I would, so that's why I like to do trans channel. So I don't know what the heck I'm saying. I have no freaking clue. And it took my partner, uh, Callum Lamb, to finally say, Krista, what she's saying is really good information that the world needs to know. You just need to start doing this publicly. You need to start sharing this. I'm like, really? <laughs> and then my best friend, Karen, she was like, uh, she actually moved from Oklahoma to work with me because she just, you know, felt my passion and felt my vision so clearly. And she was like, Krista, yeah, like this is, this is your path. This is your mission. So I've been doing it public publicly now for about two years. And it's amazing because I know how much your path is opening up. I mean, I won't mention some of the big projects you have going on, but this is this is ordained for sure, uh, yeah. without a doubt. And with, you know, what was shared was so beautiful. And I want to dip a little bit into creating safety in a relationship and what specifically does safety mean? And of course, I mean a relationship, not dating. I mean, when you're really with somebody. Yeah. Okay. Um, so safety is one of the four pillars. Um, in order to have safety, so each pillar kind of builds upon itself. Um, I'll, I'll show I'll show the diagram real quick if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Does it come through okay? It does, yeah. Beautiful. So at the bottom, we have security. Next, we have trust then we have safety, then we have honor. 
And anybody who would like this, um, I am creating little cards that you can just email me and I can mail you one. Um, because they're so important. These four pillars are pivotal. If you want to have my internet cut out spirits leaving <laughs> or more spirits coming in who knows it always happens um but if you want to have a sacred space these four pillars need to be in place first within yourself then with your partner so you need to focus on these four pillars within yourself first and in order for safety to be present you definitely have to have to security and trust you got to have those because they kind of build upon each other so in regards to safety that you had asked about, safety is in essence, you are safe to be yourself. You are safe to do what you want to do. You uh, have no whims or problems. If you want to go to a sound bath tonight and not do dinner, your partner is gonna say, okay, yeah, go do you. So you, cause you're safe, you're completely safe. So that is what safety is. And safety within yourself is not holding back, you know, not, uh, you know, shying away from who you are, not shying away from your sole purpose. You know, if you want to write that book, you know, get a hold of Debbie and get it going and start, you know, experiencing the full beauty of writing and experiencing and voicing your voice. Um, if, if some people's sole purpose is supposed to be a mother. So really just dive into being a mother and who, like, you know, nurturing your children. Uh, so it's like being safe and saying, yeah, I being a mother is enough. That is enough for me. I've like ever since I was a child, I wanted to be a mother. And now here I am. So having that safety within yourself. Mm. Um, the anti-pillar to safety that you'll know that you are out is uh, shame. If you have shame around something, um, I just got out of a 15 year marriage where I was constantly guilted and shamed for my spiritual beliefs wow. and my, for my spiritual gifts. To this day, he still thinks I'm a devil worshiper and scamming people for money. Oh. Um, and so I spent 15 years with that, with guilt and shame, like heavy, heavy, heavy. We had a lot of security and trust, but the safety and honor was not there. So the opposite of honor is uh, guilty and guilt trips. And with some of the ways that you described safety, such as I want to go to a sound bath and your partner says, beautiful, you do you. That also, that sounds to me more like being sovereign. And my understanding, and please address this, of being safe is that there's a place where you are aware of your partner in such a way that you can create a container that they can be intimate. They can really give you their heart and their body and their being to have this sacred experience with. Because to me anyway, without safety, there is no way to have all of that if you can't make your partner feel safe. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, Magdalene teaches it a little bit differently that, that sh she feels that you have to have the security and trust before you can feel safe. You, you have to know that you're secure and that your partner's not gonna go anywhere. You have to trust in knowing that, uh, you know, they are, you know, really all in and that they're not straying anywhere else. Um, and then it moves into safety of being safe. So you got to have that security and trust before you can be safe. That and makes so much that you, sense. Yeah. So I love that you use the word sovereign because this, all, these four pillars is what Magdalene calls the sovereignty pillars. Oh. So good job. <laughs> and sovereignty is a huge word uh, that we are bringing forward of how to be sovereign beings. In fact, I'm creating a whole sovereignty academy around all these teachings and it'll be an online school probably about next year so look out for that but sovereignty academy is like learning how to be sovereign within yourself and sovereign within a relationship i'm seeing so many um a lot of my clients and my one-on-ones are dealing with codependency and it's about moving away from codependent behavior and being solid and sovereign in yourself you should have your own hobbies you should have your own life outside of your relationship your relationship should not be everything now, um, in hypnotherapy school, we teach about um, EMP sexuality. It's a little bit like the five love languages. Um, and if you are a physical sexual, sex and relationship will always be your number one. 
It will always be your number one. If you're an emotional sexual, your career will always be number one. Mm. So as a physical sexual, yes, your relationship and sex is number one, but it is uh, that it is so very much important that you still have your own hobbies. You still have your own things where you don't get completely wrapped up and physical sexuals can very much get wrapped up in relationship and sex. And so my teachings teach you how to see beyond that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What you just said, where you said the the trust and what was the other word that has to come first? Uh, security and trust. It's a hundred percent. I know this is accurate because I've had it in a relationship where if I wasn't clear that my partner was fully with me, that there might be some engagement going on between him and someone else, then if there is no trust and security, then I never felt safe. And then there was what might look like codependence, but it actually wasn't. It was like, I'm too afraid you're going to go somewhere and do something or meet someone or you know, misbehave or call this person or whatever it's going to be. And so it really kicks up a lot of, um, you know, emotional dirt uh, that can manifest and look like codependence, but it's really like, I don't feel safe and I don't feel secure. Right. And so when you have that fear that your partner is going to leave you, there is some trauma that's underlying there that you need to cure. Because if you are in a true spiritual partnership, uh, if he wanted to go or she wanted to go and be with somebody else, you'd be so sovereign within yourself. It'd be like, fine. Like if you, if you're not here for me, then I don't want to be here for you yeah. and be completely okay with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so not to say that it's not right. So there is some trauma and hypnotherapy. That's why I became a certified hypnotherapist is to, uh, really dig deep into those wounds and heal yourself so these triggers don't keep coming up and it also very likely could be past life and stem from past life so i also do past life regressions and help people with the channeling if, if their higher guides need to come in stuff like that um, there's a lot of healing that can be done if if so there's there's healthy jealousy and then there's destructive jealousy and it's a very fine line that we can walk with that mm -hmm. yeah sure we can be jealous like hey i don't want you talking to so and so i don't you know that's that's not for my best and highest good and it's up to your partner whether they honor that or not so yeah and when it comes to commitment between partners choosing each other in a long-term vision as spiritual beings who are also interested in healing and sex magic what is the importance of partners giving and receiving commitment and talk about what does commitment look like? I mean, someone can say I'm committed, but maybe they're still texting somebody. So what is that all about? What is that com real commitment? Because you and I are talking on a different level than other places. We're talking as true spiritual beings in a human experience. Yes. Yeah, so uh, commitment looks like and, um, Esther Hicks and Abraham, who Abraham literally gave me the baton and said, go do what we do. Uh, they, I love their line. So I got to coin her and give her credit. Um, her uh, marriage vows with Jerry was, I like you. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> really? Yes. And I, I like you a lot. Let's see how this goes. So it should be a day-to-day -day practice. You are not committed to each other for life. You are not committed to each other even for a week. It should be day to day. Well, I like when I'm working with couples, I like a three month check in every three months. Let's check in. Do we still want to be here? Do we still want to do this? Are we still committed to each other and commitment? You're going to have to put your own boundaries. You're going to have to be in agreement with what your boundaries are. Is texting with someone outside of your boundaries? Does it make you again? A little bit of jealousy is OK because it keeps you vigilant. It keeps you vigilant in the relationship, but it shouldn't go to the extreme of um, narcissistic or obsessive behavior. That's when you know one of your pillars is out of place. Mm -hmm. So Magdalene says very, very keenly, and I, I, I got, I taught, I got taught this at age ten, believe it or not, very young age. Um, but she, I, I was already, um, I was sexually abused from the ages of five to ten, so I was very highly sexualized. Um, so she taught me about the four pillars 
and at age 10. And she said penetration should not happen on any level unless all four pillars are in place, hmm. period. And I have held that truth with me. And so I have had not many sexual partners. My sexual partners have, they've withheld the four pillars. They have withheld the four pillars and they have honored and respected me. And there was full security, trust and safety. So one night stands are off the table. <laughs> um, now this, this, the four pillars, she also says this, uh, she's very realistic and very like modern and just to the point. This is in regards to penetration. Kissing and oral sex does not pertain to this. It's when penetration happens because you're literally allowing the man or the woman, even penetration with two women or two men, when someone inserts into your body, they are literally mixing energy with you. Yeah. And it is sacred. Mm. Uh, for some reason, oral sex doesn't pertain to this. I guess Magdalene says the stomach, you know, deludes all of it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it is about, especially through, you know, the anus or the vagina. This is what I'm really, she's really concerning about any type of penetration there. The four pillars need to be in place. Now, when we get into sacred partnership, she even goes to the extreme of if these four pillars are not in place, you should not be sleeping next to each other. It's like, wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Um, and um, this Oh my goodness, there's so many avenues I can go down. I'm really trying to keep it narrow here. But yeah, sleeping next to each other is uh, also I, uh, very ideal for certain type of energy types. Some energy types need to sleep alone or to have a barrier. So I'm a type of person that I need to sleep alone. Um, so, and uh, okay, fine. She's like, just say it. So I'm very much an advocate for human design. Human design is amazing. Magdalene really talks about human design and I'm a manifester. I'm a pure manifester. So as a manifester, I need to be in my own aura because my aura repels. My aura pushes people away, believe it or not. <laughs> Unless you come close and get to know me, then I attract, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so I need to be alone. So my partner and I, it's almost like bundling back in the day. So I have a body pillow in between us and I, am, I have my own covers. This is how we keep separate. Um, but if the four pillars are not in place, one of us will sleep on the couch. And I am very strong with that. Mm. And there are, there's been some nights where it's like, okay, because the four pillars should be checked in on daily for yourself and then for your partnership. And this is where communication, communication, communication comes in. Having a spiritual partnership is not easy, not easy at all because it's constant communication and it can be a little draining of saying hey i got triggered by this and this and this today and then your partner will be like okay let's dig deep into it and this is a daily thing <laughs> um as you guys mature and grow there will be less triggers because you will be healing yourself mm -hmm. so uh the yeah so the four pillars need to be in place wow amazing explanation okay and very interesting about the human design bringing that in I know there'll be people who really like that part. Yeah. Um, I've read that people who are, are in touch with their sexual energy manifest a greater degree of personal power in the world and being born sometimes with extreme amounts of sexual energy mm -hmm. can be indicative of Kundalini rising, a sign that your soul is ripe for the spiritual path. So mm -hmm. learning to transmute this energy is it key to our material and spiritual development because i know in ancient societies that fact was known and sacredly studied guarded and taught by the sexual the sacred sexual priestess classes yeah so um i'm gonna take it back to human design <laughs> because uh we have moved from a seven chakra into a nine chakra system and there's actually a gate called the gate of sexuality so our human evolution has evolved to where there's not so much sexual desire in many of us anymore huh. if you have the gate of sexuality uh which is gate 59 then you have an overabundance and you have activation within that so you can use that kundalini energy to heal other people or to heal yourself 
um, I don't know the percentage, but you know, there's, there's a percentage of people who have this gate 59 and that is correct for them to use their sexual energy for this, for manifestation in particular. If you do not have this gate 59, there's, there's other things in the human design chart. And if you're ever interested, I, uh, my partner, Callum Lamb does these amazing design, human design readings. Uh, but there, uh, it shows you how to properly manifest within your human design chart. So sexual manifestation is not for everybody. Can it be used by everybody? Absolutely. But with the extreme that you are talking about is only select few people can do that. Oh, amazing. So I wanna ask this question for those who do understand human design, maybe not at the level that Callum does, but have maybe know what they are. I'm also, I'm a two, four manifester. Really? And maybe, yes. <laughs> And when you say gate 59, do you mean, because I know what the gates look like and some, like I have, for me, everything that's, well, you know, in the human design, the body figure, everything in the middle is completely open. Ooh. And so, um, but I don't know about 59, I'll look it up. Do you mean that someone who is um, oriented with the sexual energy, certainly I have tons of it. So mm -hmm. do you mean that that would be filled in or that would be empty? It will, uh, so, okay. so. An open sacral, which means it's empty, it's not shaded in, means that you take on other people's sexual persona. You do not have an identification of sexual, per sexual persona for yourself. So you will go and seek out other sexual personas and try them on. So you will be like, so you will be very curious. You'll be very explorative. You'll be very like, ooh, maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try that. So that is having the open sacral. That's what that means. If it's closed sacral, uh, it means that you, you know, you like position, the missionary position and, you know, the lotus position and that's it. You know what you like. You're very strict. You're very, you know, not strict, but you're very just, you know what you like. That's a, that's a defined sacral to my understanding. Um, so that's the difference between open and closed sacral. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's so interesting. It, it's um, really is. And Magdalene, completely advocates uh, human design and gene key. Not been very familiar with gene key, but uh, she's very advocate on both of those. Oh, that's so cool. All right. So is sexual energy a reflection of a person's power? I mean, based on what you just said, does that not apply at all or it does apply? Um, it depends on how you want to use it. Um, it can definitely be a sense of power within yourself. Um, but if you do not have that sexual prowess, it, your power can come from different avenues. Uh, you can, you can, Magdalene has something to say about this. <laughs> She's saying you can always magnify your sexual power for owning your sexual power is really key to the human experience, especially in modern times where it's been very, uh, toned down and diluted down and um, sexualized with, uh, you know, porn and, you know, advertisements. We all know sex sells. So it's learning what your sexual power is, even going down to what your gender identity is and being okay with that. Uh, you know, if you were born into a female body does not necessarily mean you are female. So it's, that that's where safety really comes in of safety within yourself of knowing you know are you attracted to women are you attracted to men are you omnisexual are you pansexual and it's such a i'm getting emotional it's such a beautiful thing where we have all these i don't like calling them labels but different categories where we're like yeah i'm this or i'm a little bit of that so you can really explore and it's really open now um your sexuality and your gender identification mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's that's where you find your power. That's mm -hmm. where you find your power in knowing who you are mm -hmm. and expressing it and being okay with expressing it and uh, in a beautiful, loving way. So if there's power in divine sexuality, how do we keep the magic and the love and the excitement alive in a relationship? Is there a set of practices that we can follow creating magic and lasting love? Um, Communication, I would just say that's number one. Keeping it alive. Um, sacred sex rituals are very beautiful. Um, anointing each other is very intimate, very sacral and sexual. And if you pair that with some massage oils, 
So it's like, don't dive straight into penetration. Don't dive, don't, don't go in with that orgasm in mind. Go in with connection. Go in with, um, you know, nashak, that is the sacred breath between the two. Uh, you can have full body orgasm just by kissing if you are very in tune and in touch. Um, penetration doesn't really have to happen or any clitoral stimulation. Uh, even, you know, gazing each other's eyes. So having that connection um, at least once a week. Mm. Um, I heard recently, and I'm, I apologize, I don't remember where I heard this from, but it was like 90 minutes a week you should be sending, spending with your partner in that intimate time, mm. 90 minutes. Whether, and it doesn't have to full on mean sex, it could be just deep conversation but to keep the relationship alive. And if you have to schedule it in, do it because it's so highly important. Um, your partner, um, going back to the um, emotional and physical sexuals, physical sexuals need to have sex or an orgasm or some type of release every single day. Emotional sexuals cannot have sex every day, cannot have that release. So they're usually on a three day pattern. Once every three days, they need to be having sex. Or if there's trauma involved, it can go to five days, it can go to a week, it can go into a month. I'm working with somebody right now who's a high emotional sexual where she only wants sex once a year. Can't imagine that. <laughs> but we've actually gotten down to six months. But in a healthy emotional sexual, they wanna have sex once every three to five days. So you need to understand that about your partner because usually a physical sexual mm -hmm. partner with an emotional sexual. And so the physical sexual needs to get their rocks off every day where the emotional needs to understand, okay, my partner's going to do that. But she also, or he also honors that I'm not going to have sex every day and only every three to five days are we going to be intimate in that way. Mm. So know your partner, know, know your sexual cycles, uh, know your emotional cycles, um, how to keep it alive is continue to work at it never stop exploring each other, never stop finding new things to do. Uh, even if, you know, my parents have been married for 47 years and they're still finding new things to do together. So it's like keeping it alive um, and it, it's work, 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 but let's not call it work, let's call it play. Just play with each other, have fun, let that inner child out and discover. There's always something new to discover. I, when you're saying all this, I'm I'm become really curious about divine partnership between Yeshua and Mary. And I guess because we started this conversation on the divine feminine and how there's a rise and a healing going on, my question would be: in their partnership, how did Yeshua show up for Mary? How did he make her feel honored and secure, and uh, that there was trust there and safety, et cetera? So what I just talked about with the, the, the sacred time together. So they had sacred time together. They had time away from the apostles, away from everything where it was just them two. And they and Magdalene would actually prophesize and have visions and Yeshua would support her and, you know, withhold her and say and communicate. And um, what, what's the term you're using? Hold on, let me ask her interpret. He would help interpret the visions because she was coming from a high physical metaphysical plane. And that's how he would support her by interpreting the messages because he was of divine light already. Um, and he was like, okay, this is what this and this means. And so they brought beautiful teachings together and blended the two cultures together. Um, and she, he upheld, upheld her. Um, it's even said in Mary Magdalene's gospel and the Gnostic gospels, where the disciples said, why did he love you more than us? And it's because everybody saw the love that he had for her. The way she said, the, the way that he looked at her was like no one else was around. No, it was like the whole world disappeared. And she said it was from the moment they first locked eyes, it was like they were the only two people on earth. Mm -hmm. And so that's how he made her feel special. That's how, and he honored her teachings. Mm -hmm. He honored her to teach alongside with him mm -hmm. saying, yes, you will honor her as much as you honor me. And again, that is found over and over in the Gnostic gospels, how, you know, uh, 
the, the disciples were like, well, who are you? You're just a woman. And he's like, no, you will listen to her because she is of equal faith of me. So that is, I could go on and on how she, how he honored, honored her. <laughs> um, but they, it was, it was a true beauty, beauty between the two of them. And I am so grateful that, you know, I've seen, I've seen them both together in spirit and how it's, it's a true, true eternal flame when they are in presence of each other. It's, it's something I hope that everybody can witness at some point in their lives with, with a partner for themselves or just by a vision of them together. It's just glorious. And I've seen other sacred partners like Radha and Krishna. They have that same type of woo. And uh, so many, you know, uh, King Solomon and Sheba, they do too. There's so many beautiful partners out there that we can learn from. Yeah, I moved to <clears throat> tears when you were saying that. I really could feel it. And I could feel to be the recipient of somebody really seeing you and loving you. Um, yeah, to be received like that is everything, really. Everything. And you know it. And it's actually the first time it happens, it's extremely uncomfortable. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's almost like you crawling out of your skin, like, ah! is my you know is my hair good my, what am i doing da, 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 because we start getting into ego uh, but once you remove all that and really truly just be seen and held when was the last time you, get, you were held in a true honoring way or that you had sex in an honoring way uh it's it's something beautiful to witness and to experience is there a ritual or a practice that you do every day, Krista, that keeps you really grounded and centered? Yes, my anointing oils. I anoint myself every single day. <laughs> um, these oils have the chakras one through seven and then eight through 14. Um, so not only the seven chakras, but the higher chakras as well. And spike nard. Spike nard is my go-to. I love spike nard. Spike nard is what Magdalene carried in her alabaster jar. In fact, at the um, dinner of, um, of uh, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, where Magdalene came over and anointed Jesus and like anointed his whole body. And Judas is like, what are you doing? That's expensive oil. We could use it somewhere else. And Yeshua was like, let her do what she's going to do. She is doing her life's purpose. So that was spike nard that was anointed all over him. And it's amazing stuff. Um, of course, I much prefer the Egyptian uh, pure oil, uh, but other essential oils, uh, they're good. I'll just say that. But if you can get the pure Egyptian oil, and I do sell it, so um, they're Bloom uh, Egyptian anointing oils. And so they're amazing, amazing. Are those on your website? Not yet. Um, but yeah, I'll get it up there. I'll get it up there today. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Now that <laughs> I know, <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> I'm, I'm very new. I just became an affiliate seller. I'm the only. I'm the second seller in the United States of these. And so, uh, yeah, I will. I will, that that will be available on my website by the time you listen to this. <laughs> awesome, Krista. This is Dare to Dream. So, what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and future goals? Well, I am so blessed. I am going on a pilgrimage to the south of France to where Magdalene went after the crucifixion. So I dare to dream to walk in her footsteps and to preach in the way that she preached after the crucifixion and carrying on the message of the way of love and carrying on the four pillars and the 12 energetic bodies. That's what I'm doing. And I'm so blessed to be able to do that uh, this year. Um, and I dare to dream to invite all of you to go on this journey with me and to experience true bliss in your life. Beautiful. And I just want to let folks know that Krista is actually going to be back on the show in two months. Uh, my partner is going to interview her on the Dare to Dream platform because he is going to explore something she spoke about in the very beginning, which is about going galactic, going outside of this planet and possibly this universe to the conversation he loves and where I know Krista can go too. So it's gonna be a whole different, amazing conversation. And if you wanna find out more about her, go to Krista, it's C-R-I-S-T-A, MarieMiller.com. Krista, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. It's been amazing. And I end today's show with this quote from Rina Kumara Singham.
The separation of feminine and masculine has torn us into pieces. The balance of feminine and masculine will bring us back to peace. Thanks for tuning in today. If you're listening to the podcast and you'd like to see myself and the guest, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Please subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Give us a like and subscribe. And next week on the show, I'm featuring Susie Carter. Susie is the profit coach. And Susie says, wealth is your birthright. She helps small businesses owners and entrepreneurs create reliable, high quality financial resources. She is a pistol. (laughs) She's hilarious and fabulous. You're going to want to check her out. Folks, thank you so much for daring to dream. Remember to give yourself pleasure for whatever sacred sexuality is to you with you or with others. You deserve it. That is also your birthright.